<laughs> I'm George Flynn. You're watching In Depth TV. We appreciate you being here, and I've got a special guest. Uh, how, what what is your title? Well, Mr. Ogle. Well, Jimmy Ogle. G I know I, Jimmy Ogle, but, uh, but is it Duckmaster? Is well, it county former county historian? Is it? What, I, what when is I it? usually get introduced this last year, I'm lifelong Memphian, on call Duckmaster, Shelby County historian. And until they read the minutes in a couple of weeks, I'll still be the Shelby County historian. We okay. do have a new Shelby County historian coming in. Well, what are you going to do when you miss that pay? Well, we used to pay uh, Ed Williams a dollar a year. It paid me zero dollars a year. So you you're see, getting so, ready, I, so we could double I, your pay well, and be great. Triple my pay, even like yeah. you know. But no, it, it wasn't a thing. It's a different pay because uh, uh, it was an appointed position by Shelby County Board of Commissioners, and I was honored to be uh, appointed. Ed Williams was the second. Ellen Davies Rogers was the third. And I'm sure you knew yeah. both those no. folks. And our fourth will be Jimmy Rout the third. So you'll enjoy talking to him here. That's right. And as you can tell. <clears throat> Jimmy and I go way back. We're <laughs> close friends, and you're going to eavesdrop on an on a conversation where we're talking about Memphis and history and Shelby mm -hmm. County. And we, before we we started the cameras, we were talking, and I said, uh, "What do you want to talk about?" He said, "Well, we'll come up with some." So, what would you like to talk about? Because this is your show now, okay. and you're ready to. Say whatever you want to say. Well, I appreciate what you do, number one. I want to talk about you for a second. No, no, no. <laughs> no but with the radio and the TV and all you do to, to promote goodwill in Memphis and get people talking in particular and, 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 and talking about our history and our lives and sharing memories and all that. It's just a, it's a fun thing. And, and I have the privilege. Of, I did it over 200 times last year. I went to schools and senior living centers mm -hmm. and talked and got to meet people and hear their stories. One lady at Kirby Pine, she was the first woman to – Jump out of an airplane for the U.S. Air Force, you know, a paratrooper in 1974. Wow. Just wow. stories like that. I, I don't want to embarrass anybody <clears throat> here, but just your unusual stories like that or the person who handed the record to Dewey Phillips. When you see Dewey spinning that record, you know, yes. he is out there. he's the one that handed him that record. He's out there at Kirby Pass. Oh I forget gosh. his name right now. I got it written down. But, my goodness. But people like that who are on the fringe of history, mm -hmm. we see, we know all the Sam Phillips and the Elvis Presleys and the Dr. Kings and the Ernest Withers, but it's the backline people, the producers and the musicians and the cameramen and things like that, that you get to hear their side of the stories too, the ones that are on the periphery all the time. And what I like when I talk about history, uh, I always say that there's no city in America that tells a story of American history better than Memphis, Tennessee, good, bad, or ugly. When you look at the early Native Americans and European explorers to the 20th century entrepreneurs, from civil war to civil rights, music, medicine, transportation, distribution, all the first, all the highlights. I say I got about 150 hours of history mm -hmm. in my head, and I got about 40 minutes to talk about it. So that's why I talk real fast. You got to slow me down. Well, <laughs> you, know? you know, on this show yeah. we can we can go slowly, can, yes, and that's the reason there's there's no timer running on you, and you okay. you can just tell. Tell me, and other people will be listening and watching, tell me what, what you consider the And the reason we're doing this, and we may do a couple of these, <laughs> yeah, we're, is we're, we're getting ready to lose him to the other side of the state. Partially. Well, I mean, he'll be back and Nobody forth. Nobody has ever driven to my house to ask me a question. They've always called me on the telephone and got me on the Internet. Well, that, now, now, Knoxville has that, internet and telephone. You know what I mean? The, oh, they do? Yeah, they do. They have it all the way over there now. Yes, sir. I know they do. Oh, my God. Yes, sir. Tennessee is really... My daddy's from Etowah, as you mm -hmm. well know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you can't say that word, <laughs> I mean, when I first saw it, I said, how would you pronounce this word? And so, well, how would you spell it? <laughs> well, you start with an O. Well, it's an, actually an E. An E. There's an Utawal. That's You're right. You're confused. It's Etawal. That's E T O W A H. See, there you, you learned a little history right there. Okay, or we've spelling. got we've been spelling, <laughs> but okay, we've got all of this wealth of knowledge. What do you think are the most significant parts of history that we we don't quite grasp? I think we, we undersell uh, our contributions by your profession, the medical profession, over the years. Number one, I mean, it's, it's the second largest employer in Memphis right now, and obviously with a lot of big drivers, whether it's St. Jude or Le Bonner or UT Medical. But you think about how it got started basically in war and tragedy. With the, mm -hmm. During the Civil War, we housed over 7,000 wounded Union soldiers here. 
with no battles in Memphis at all. No right. Buildings being burned. We were collecting them all over the South. But then after the Civil War, we were very basically untouched by the Civil War because the railroad that came mm-hmm. in, the transportation, that's the other thing we undersell. And then after the Civil War, the mosquito came up. We had the yellow fever. Yellow fever. It almost wiped out the city. Lost <clears throat> right. our charter. So there were two big... And, and right after the Civil War, the Sultana tragedy, too, the, the, the big riverboat that sank, the largest maritime disaster in the history of our country. Mm-hmm. 200 more people died than the Titanic. Really? You know, that was uh, 1,700 people. So you look at how we uh, had to be in healthcare and, and emergency and, and by necessity. And then you look at the discovery, whether it's Dr. Willis Campbell, Campbell mm-hmm. Clinic, you know, right. it's a seminal manual for orthopedic medicine in this country. I think it's in this 10th version now. Of course, University of Tennessee I began their medical, or opened their medical school here in 1911. And now it's grown to be a pharmaceutical, dental, and uh, medicine, I believe, right, right now. Right. I, I've had four or five or six relatives graduate from their parents mm-hmm. and grandparents and aunts, like Aunt Evelyn, right. you knew where, where well, I knew a lot of, uh, a lot of like your relatives. Only, only female graduate <laughs> of uh, her class at in the 40s and, and the first uh, female president of the Memphis Medical Society in 1992. I, believe, I, re- I remember when about. Evelyn was el- yes, elected. Sir. So, uh, uh, and... Um, and you look at up La Barra, there's a sewing circle of a little, little old lady sewing clothes with red threads for orphans in the 1920s. Look what La Barra's grown to be. Right. Look what Baptists and Methodists have grown to be. And look what St. Jude. Well, we, we, we're getting on up to St. Jude in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. You know, just, it had that first year it opened up, it had a $1 million budget for the entire year and had about a 4% success rate. And what people don't understand, it was the first integrated hospital in Memphis. It received the first time a, a local hospital received a patient regardless of race, creed, color, nationality, or ability to pay. Think about that. He thought, you know, he was doing a lot of things here in Memphis at any time. So I don't think he'd think he's going to get into the cancer business like he did real big. But now that success rate's grown to be over 90%, mm-hmm. but it costs two and a half million dollars a day. And no child or parent or family pays for their travel, their treatment, their housing, their food on any visit. Right to St. Jude. It's expanding again now. You look at International Children's Heart Foundation with Dr. William Novick, mm-hmm. babyheart.org. Right. And what they've done for over 20 years in over 30 foreign countries and performed 6,000 open heart surgeries for babies with congenital heart failure 30 days or younger. Mm-hmm. With teams right. going over. And some of those babies now are coming back to work for them. That's, That's a really amazing. cool story there. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Shea Ear Clinic. Mm-hmm. Dr. John Shea, you know, and uh, gosh, Southern College of Optometry. So hospitals, health care, and, uh, and medicine are our number two employer in Memphis. And I think that's kind of undersung. It's a huge economic impact here. Okay. We're going to, get, going to get into something that is very contentious, probably. Uh, Memphis and Nashville, the rivalry. Where did it start? What has happened why is Nashville growing so rapidly now and Memphis not? And this this goes back to history, and, and you're the history I don't historian. think it goes back to history. I think it was, it was growing in modern times. I mean, Nashville didn't pass this 100 years ago, 150 years ago. I mean, you know, it's passed right. in the last 20 but why, years. Why was there all the, the animosity early on? You remember the thing about the license plate where we were the number one county and yeah. Nashville didn't Well, that like was done by county, not by city. You know? right. And, of course, we were probably, as a city, twice as big as Nashville was. You know, Nashville consolidated their governments 50 years ago. That was right. one thing, I believe, that happened. And another thing that happened, too, is Memphis is kind of split between three states. When you think about it, we're right in the corner here between Arkansas, mm-hmm. Mississippi, and Tennessee. Right. And if you look as we grew on the highest piece of ground on the Mississippi River, and went through the desegregation of our city in the 60s, mm-hmm. uh, the east, the eastern flight out. We couldn't go to the west, couldn't grow in a central fashion because of the floodplain. Nashville's center of downtown is in a central fashion, right. too, geographically and physically. So we all went lopsided that way, mm-hmm. and downtown emptied out. More people living in jail in downtown Memphis in the night, by 1979 than living residentially. 500 lived downtown. There's a thousand in jail. All the businesses were closed up. Peabody was closed. You know, bought for, less, bought for half a million dollars. Orphan was bought for $285,000, the Rainbow Tail for $140,000. That's less than a million dollars in seven years. We saved those three big things. Memphis was empty, gone. There had been in the 60s uh, 15 different urban renewal projects that mm-hmm. tore down over uh, 572 acres, over 3,000 buildings. You still some, see some empty over there outside of the ring of downtown. That's how we built FedEx for them and Weston and Gibson Guitar, those empty lands. You still see them. So we emptied out. We had a hard time handling a desegregation in our community. Uh, then the King assassination was a sign right. of the most watershed moment in the history of the civil rights movement of our country. Um, 
So I think that flight occurred to us. So incidents there occurred to us. And then the we're still recovering chapter, probably from uh, that. Yeah, and I think we're still recovering too from the hard, uh, separate but equal campaigns of the middle of the century between the Crumps and the churches and, mm-hmm. and all those factors there. Uh, you know, uh, post-World War II, you know, it was uh, sharecroppers were coming into Memphis. Uh, they served in the World War II fighting for the country. They go back to be a sharecropper. Well, they want to stay on the farm. And, of course, the government's going into agribusiness, and the big white farmers are getting all the money and subsidies and spraying the chemicals and all that, and the sharecroppers are getting nothing. So they come into the city for economic opportunity. Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit come up in that delta, just like they did at the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. You know, just like they did during the Civil War. We were a sanctuary city during the Civil War. We can't say that because that term went around at the time, but we doubled our population during the Civil War. Most cities lost population. We got buildings burned in the South. We were a very strategic northern town untouched right. in the Civil War, uh, and grew a, a heavy black population. So through the century, you know, we've been pretty balanced black to white population. Now it's turning, it's more, it's 63% black now, and mm-hmm. 30% white in the city. And of that 63% white right now, I mean black right now, 29% is poverty level or below. So we've always had a real disparity in Memphis between the haves and the have-nots, I think that's a big difference there. I think there's more of a middle class in the Nashville area. Again, Nashville consolidated government. We don't have, didn't have two overlapping right, governments. Right. Uh, didn't grow lopsided, mm-hmm. essentially. And then the state government was in Nashville, too. And I think a lot of things happened with the power of state government being in that city as opposed to being on the very end over here. And we're very different. I thought, you know, I mentioned in one of my programs, we ought to secede. We ought to go up to take the Boot Hill of Missouri, take Perigold, Jones, Broken Down, Crowley's Ridge, right. all the way to Helena, go across to Oxford, right? Get to Oxford, get to casinos, mm-hmm. go up to Tennessee River, take West Tennessee, make that Delta, make that the 51st state, because we have nothing in common with Middle Tennessee. And certainly my family in East Tennessee, and those hillbillies up there and everything, mm-hmm. the Ogles. And uh, and we'd be and Memphis would be right in the center of that, not split between Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Think how many people come over those bridges a day. Right, fifty five thousand mm-hmm. on both bridges a day coming back from now. A lot of that's traffic going through, not all residential or people working and going back. They say like three hundred million dollars a year worth of discretionary income goes to Tunica. We don't get a penny of that, you know. Okay, let's go go to this, and uh, we are d- veering off of history yeah, a little bit. History. <laughs> Why in the world? Does Memphis not have casinos? Politics. Because they've, they've got them right it's across the bridge line. in well, Arkansas. State, again, that's the state line I'm talking about. They've got them uh, down. It took a long Tunica. time to get it to West Memphis, though. Remember, they, they, they had horse racing and dog racing for about 50 years, mm-hmm. and forever to get casino by games, by electronic games. Not you know. Was there, uh, was there ever a movement to make uh, a part of downtown Memphis, maybe even the Pyramid, uh, give it to the uh, Indian Reservation. Make it. A, a I casino. heard that a little bit, saying that was Indian land, so that's sovereign land. But you know, it, it, whatever makes that um, legit. Now, I mean, there mm-hmm. were there was obviously the called the Indian Removal Act back when I guess in the right. 1830s, 1832, and Andrew Jackson moved more Native Americans than anybody. I'm one of our co-founders here and the seventh president of the United States, from the Nashville area, by the way. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the three founders of Memphis, by the way, all were from the Nashville area. They never lived here. This is a pure oh, real estate. Are you serious? John Overton, James Winchester, Andrew Jackson. Their homes are still there as historic homes. Uh, James Winchester's in Cragfont, okay. about 25 miles uh-huh. northeast, uh, Castilian Springs. Uh, he was one of the co-founders. His son was the first mayor, Marcus Winchester. Right. John Overton and, and uh, Traveler's Rest in Franklin. It's this historic home, of course, mm-hmm. the Hermitage and Andrew Jackson. So this was a pure real estate venture form. Not, they didn't live here at all. How did Mr. Crump fit into all of that? Well, he moved in from Holly Springs and came on up in the turn of the next century. You know, okay, he so he wasn't 19... part of the found. No, His... no, he was 100 years after that. He was, yes, okay. Sir. That was all. And so this, this was 1819. This, this is 200 was a... years ago. That's one reason why we're talking about A big venture. real estate venture. Only 5,000 acres, yes, sir, uh, that was bought by Mr. Overton for $500 <laughs> way back in like 1791. Mm-hmm. And the city was, it was the acreage, basically Union Avenue to Cooper. Cooper to Valentine, mm-hmm. and Valentine back to the river. That was his big uh, okay. track there. And they, they the first city was laid out in 1819, basically between where the Pyramid and St. Jude are, down to Union Avenue, mm-hmm. from Danny Thomas to the river. 1,300 acres. Those streets are still there, the same thing, right. same street names and everything. About 362 lots, and that's how we started. And it was really slow going. And the reason why we're here, we're on this high bluff. 
used to flood 35 miles right, in that direction. Right. And centuries ago, the little animals didn't want to get their paws wet. So when the water flooded in the spring, they just go up on the high ground. Mm -hmm. Poplar's an old ridge. Lamar's an old ridge. And they'd walk out of those old ridges because when the Wolf River and Anaconda swole up, they would get their paws wet. The yeah. Native Americans followed the animal pass. The European explorers followed the Native American pass. The American settlers followed the European pass. And we had stagecoaches. And then we paved Poplar. You know, when Hernando de Soto came wandering through here, he was looking for the Pacific Ocean. This is 1541 yeah. and gold. And he got to the high <laughs> bluff here in the spring of the year, and all he could see for 35 miles was water. Mm -hmm. He thought he discovered the Pacific oh, Ocean. Oh, really? Because he thought the Ohio River flowed into the Gulf of California, not the Gulf of Mexico. And you were around at that time, weren't you? The Earth was oh, flat, yeah, Earth was flat that. at that time. It was real flat, you know. Yeah. But that was 79 years before the Pilgrims land lit Plymouth Rock. When we grew up, Plymouth Rock was like Genesis 1 1. Yes, it was. The founding of America. We're the first uh, uh, engagement, river engagement between Europeans and Native Americans in the history of our country, way out here, 79 years before the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. So we're number six on the National Register of Historic Places for listings in our country behind Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, and New Orleans. We have over 11,000 properties listed, 31 neighborhoods on the National Register, mm -hmm. some great tall buildings in downtown Memphis, you know. And that, that you know, you just hit a nerve. That's what we need to know about so that we can have a sense of pride in ourselves yes. rather than looking on ourselves like, oh, we're second to Nashville, we're second to this, we're second to that. I, didn't, yeah. so I never thought we're second, I thought we're different. A lot, well, a lot of people are, are now beginning to believe that because they say, have you driven to Nashville? They see all of these, all this construction. And not all that's good, and they know it. I mean, right. there's a lot of good clean glass buildings down there, but they got some problems, parking people, moving people, traffic, traffic, traffic. problems, you know. But I mean, we I, have a point of pride, of uh, historical pride, right. of where this nation was founded and a lot of things. And you, you bring that, that's the key thing well, you bring. And, and my other thing, I mentioned medicine is one of the undersung things, but transportation, distribution, logistics. I-40 and I-55. Well, we're the number, uh, we say river, railways, roadways, runways. We're right. the number two inland port on the Mississippi River. That's what got us here. We were founded on the mm -hmm. river on this high bluff, the fourth Chickasaw Bluff in the on the eastern bank of the uh, ten, uh, Mississippi River in West Tennessee. So we say we're the number two inland port on the Mississippi River. We're one of three cities to have all five class one freight rail operators in it. Right. And you love that railroad track, don't you? I'll tell you I do. In a minute. I do. Uh, we're what, we're I-45, I-40 and I-55 cross in West Memphis. That's the third largest center of trucking activity and, in America. And we'll let take a little, little one other diversion. We're the only place... I-40 is not complete across the well, United States. Well, now it is, though. It is. It's rerouted. Yeah, we yeah. had three and a half miles. And I've, I, yes, sir, March 2nd, 1971, the Citizens to Preserve Overton Park versus Volpe, Secretary of Transportation. Right. The United States Supreme Court, for the first time in the history of our country, decided for the citizens, for the environment, against the government. That's the landmark case that studied for that. Correct. And it was little old ladies in tennis shoes, they say, a couple of men uh, in Midtown. They want to express they're not only going through Overton Park, but Midtown too, and of course they tore up a bunch of it. They filled it back in, and finally they they've got those. A lot of houses back. were and, sold, and, yes, sir, and and, yeah. and they rerouted on around. It's technically now that's three thousand miles from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, to Barstow, California. Correct. And that's a very landmark decision there. And then our fourth element there, I mentioned runways. Of course, we had a young man to get a C minus on a term paper at that's Yale. Right. You know, you know Fred Smith, and now. Uh, he employs 32,000 people in Memphis and 400,000 worldwide. So that's transportation, distribution, logistics. We're the number one cargo airport in America for the last 35 years. And that was just that railroad track. I think that's one of the top five events in the history of our city was that railroad track that nobody likes in East Memphis. It came from Charleston all the way to Memphis in 1857 at a time when most railroads are about 100 miles long. Mm -hmm. Not a big national network. Right. This was 800 miles long. And comparatively, it's like going to the moon at the time. Because you're riding a horse and buggy, 10 miles an hour, trails and all this, swamps. And now you're getting on a train going 50, 60 miles an hour, getting right. in a couple of days. It was a game changer. It came right to where we laid those cobblestones. We have a big steamboat wharf here. That's 1857. Uh, we brought water from the Atlantic Ocean and sprayed it to the Mississippi River, took water from the Mississippi River and sprayed it to the Atlantic Ocean. It's called Wedding of the Waters, the greatest day of human jubilee in the history of the lower Mississippi River Valley. We're pouring a bucket of water into a big Mississippi River. 
Go figure. But that's what saved us from getting destroyed by the Civil War because a Union strategy, number one, was get control of the Western Rivers. You control the ports. You control the troop and supply movement. So we're under martial law for the last few years. There's right. one naval battle here. 5,000 citizens watched on the, on the banks of Memphis because they're shooting at each other on the river, not on the land. It only lasted 90 had a, minutes because it's a such, picnic. Yeah, on it. really. It's like watching a fireworks show on an NFL football game. And it only lasted 90 minutes, but it ended up being the largest inland naval battle in the history of the world. I've told you three of the biggest things yet. I know. And we ain't even got out past the Civil War. Uh, you know, uh, But that train that everybody hates in the middle of East Memphis because it makes them late to getting their hair fixed or something mm-hmm. like that or getting to Goldsmiths, Old Court Mile. Well, not Goldsmiths anymore. But we, we're Mile. going way back. Now. I know. But, but we're in its way. It's not in our way. It was here first. We built up alongside it. You know, Fairgrounds, Bunton. I Long remember Long Bunton Station. Station. Yeah, there was, we used to get was on a, the train to go to There Edelbaugh. was a passenger yeah, uh, on the thing. West south side of Trex and the restaurants mm-hmm. over there. Mr. Correct. Wiggins Restaurant, right. Carter Seat Store. We used to wait and get go to Grandma's house that way. On the overnight train to Huntsville, Corinth, all mm-hmm. the way up and, and pick up Grandma and Aunt Hazel when they came in. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it, that's a big factor right there. And then now that the... the the eight air at the property out in Fayette County, all the trucks and all that's going out there. So there's less traffic, trains less and less. It's, it's probably 80% less of what it was, you mm-hmm. know, before they built that right. uh, transfer station out there in, in Fayette County and not down by the Coliseum. You see all the trucks coming in. So that's going to help the situation in East Memphis. Uh, there was only two underpasses under it all those years right. in, in Orange Mountain, Boston, and Josephine. When they built the hospital, St. Francis, they took it over Ridgeway. Remember, right. it was grade level at Ridgeway because of the ambulances. That's what got an underpass there. Right. Otherwise, that's why everybody hates it because it's, it's blocking them all the time getting across, but not as much as anymore. So transportation, distribution, logistics, health care, medicines, number two, I think. And, of course, music, which is not undersung, technically, because right. yeah. uh, we, we, you know, we have the culture and the music that changed the world. One of the th- couple of things I got for you here is Kevin Kane wrote a book. Our friend Kevin Kane okay. he used to be my paper boy on, on Highland Avenue in 1973. And he was the best paper Where'd boy. Where did you grow up on Highland? On Highland, right there by First Assembly. God, I didn't grow up there. I was married. That's my 1973. I grew up in the uh, Walnut Grove, Goodland area, basically. Um, I grew up in Walnut Grove and Highland. Well, okay. yeah, we're close. We can, uh, you, were, you were in the rich part, yeah, further that's out. That's right. Uh, when my I'd daddy walk, built a house there in 1957. When I'd walk to East High, it didn't, you know, Walnut Grove didn't go through. No. Nope. In fact, you, you had that Century question. Century and, and Reese, it didn't go through. Right. And uh, and uh, High Point Terrace didn't come until the 1940s. Correct. Right? The Galloway Golf Course, like 1926. But on the radio station on night, when one of your friends were talking about when when they had to go out to cut court over it and they couldn't go. Walnut Grove wasn't cut in. Right. It was cut in 1965. I didn't call in to give it to you because I like, because you, you, you know, I know you know exactly where the first McDonald's was built. Frazier. <laughs> See, you're bad. And I know you keep them folks stirred up doing that stuff all the time. So that's not well, going to call in and slam them down. But but it, w- that was. It's very interesting to see how Walnut Grove was cut in and, and jutted around the Bell's house. You know what I, mean? I so, know. And, and then, Every time I take that curve around, I, I tell Jack Bells, I said, <laughs> yeah. I, I just. And what he was talking about, how Riley, Regain, Riley LaGrange became right. Walnut Grove. And you look at all, again, all our roads are animal paths. You look at Highway 64, the old stagecoach road from 1829, Highway 70 connected. connected to San Diego to New York City in 1927 for the first time, a paved sign highway across this country. The, the Broadway of America is the Bristol Highway in America. I love talking about streets and manhole covers and things well, like that. Yeah, we were going to talk well, for, quickly about talk Tell me about that manhole well, cover. Well, I, I made a challenge with the Center City Commission 11 years ago. I could have more people on a walking tour than they had on one of their programs. I didn't. I'm mm-hmm. just talking smack, you know, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't want me to do walking tours for some reason. They want to concentrate on their music programs. And, and lo and behold, I, I came up with a great Union Avenue manhole cover and history tour. And the commercial people publicized it. They publicized it. And I had 114 people on the tour and two TV stations. So, I mean, excuse me, 91 people on the tour and two, v, two TV stations. My first November the 6th, 1934 street tour had 114 people on. And we, November the 6th. You know that number. I'm sure you've had this on the radio before. But TVA. That's when we voted to join TVA Power in 1934. But they've taken the number. The, the in 1934. Why? I don't know. I'm 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 going to MLG and W Mar for some reason. We board. got. I'm got, taking my. I got, got one of those original signs. Yeah. But, but it is the only street in America named after a month, a day, and a year. Yes. And it's because when we voted to join TVA Power, that's a unusual reason. It's not like we landed on the moon or won the Super Bowl or anything big like that. But, but it was important then. It sure we should was. not TVA. lose that history. Well, 
we're going to try to get that. Sign Where do you get those manhole covers? Those, on the, on the, even I can get them on the internet. <laughs> you can get them on the internet, yes, sir. I, I, had, I did it one time for the tour, uh -huh. and so and this bow tie I bought from Bernard Lansky the day before. So I did my first tour with this bow tie with baseballs on, from the clothier to the king. Yeah, you know, and then. Uh, the best, and that was the look. And this key right here came from the Downtown Memphis Commission this past October. This was forged at the Meta Museum. It says downtown on it. So okay. the key to downtown, yeah. not the key to the city. So I wear that with pride. You, you know? just spoke of the Metal Museum. We haven't talked. I love the Metal back. Museum. Well, in, in fact, Norma Lauren, who the next night I wore this. I was proud. I spoke at a lady's birthday party out at Ridgeway Country Club. They wanted to come speak for all, all our 100 out-of-town guests. And I was bragging about this. It turned out it was her daddy who, who got the property, who, uh, oh, who, who found yeah. it. Mr. Wolf found it, mm -hmm. the National Ornamental Metal Museum. Guess where the next closest metal museum is? Uh, Japan. Oh, really? Or Paris. Yeah. That's how special it is. Tennessee but, Fabricating Company, 1979. Mm -hmm. Those old Marine Hospital grounds, mm -hmm. you right. know. Are they going to do something with that Marine Hospital? Yeah, Lauren Cruz is developing. He's got all the... Every finally got everything in place. I saw his mother last night at one of my talks, and she told me Lauren's got the, the funding in place and gonna convert into condos. Okay, it's a beautiful residential or it's a setting up there with the tall beautiful trees. Beautiful place, cool, yeah. yeah. And French Fort's kind of isolated there, the neighborhood. Uh, a couple. Let me. Say, this is Kevin's book right here, real okay. quick. Uh, yeah. About the bicentennial. This is our bicentennial this year. We're two hundred years old. Memphis okay. and Shelby County. Of course, Memphis and May is honoring it as the foreign country. Right. Uh, but th that's a uh, good thing to talk about. It's a hundred, uh, two hundred years of heart and souls. What Kevin wrote about, with a little help from Samantha Crespo too. And, mm -hmm. and that was, you'll enjoy that as a pictorial book. You'll enjoy looking really through pretty. there. Yeah. And then I've had uh, this last year. We did the MLK fifty last year when you know the fiftieth anniversary of the assassination right. of Dr. King that we. Commemorated, not celebrated. Obviously, yeah, it's a right. very solemn moment and, uh, and a very tough time for our city, uh, and still is. But what we've done in that area between South Main, Beale, uh, East, and Lamar is identified a Memphis Heritage Trail area. Okay. The housing and community development has done this. Paul Young, Felicia Barnes, a lot of folks got together over a couple of years, and this whole area of heritage of Robert Church and Ida B. Wells and the funeral homes. This is my talk this week at the Pink Palace. It's about that lost black history of uh, century of history, black history in Memphis. And we usually talk, we know about black history or African-American history, or Negro, or colored. We have four different terms to describe 150 right. years there. But it seems like we stop at Civil War and slavery and pick back up at the sanitation strike and don't talk about what happened in between for 100 years, whether it's the preachers, the teachers, the lawyers, the insurance men. We talk about basketball and music really good, don't we, which we love. But the contributions of the A. Maceo Walkers and Joseph Walkers and Hollis Prices and Blair T. Hunts and W. Herbert Brewster and Jimmy Lunsford and Lucy mm -hmm. Campbell and Ernest Withers, the Hooks Brothers, all the, the church family. We don't talk about it. Now, this helps doing that right there. And then I had some friends. You're going to love this map. You've heard a guy named Elvis, haven't you? I heard of him. Well, they were from New York City. They used to come to Memphis all the time. They really loved coming to Memphis. And they decided to make a map about a Memphis map for Elvis fans. Okay. And there, there's 150 sites oh right here, like where he went uh, to have a milkshake or something like that. You popped in half these sites right here. I'm giving you this. Right I feel, love I feel it. the quality of that thing right there. Oh, it is. This really is good. a Memphis map for Elvis fans, and it's the all encompassing map. Very good. Where but can I, you where can you get one of these Lansky brothers or Lansky, some studio okay. or down at Graceland? But how? You know your friend Hal Lansky's got I, one of these I right know there. Him very the well. There you go, right there. That's from me to you. And say, I helped do that. My name's right there. I see. Oh, I see it. I but see. I helped do that. Uh, but history in Memphis from all sorts, whether it's manhole covers or music or medicine, uh, like it's just so interesting to talk about. I learn something new every day. I'm not a know-it-all. He knows everything there is to know about. No, I learn something new you every do. day. I hate it when people say that because I'm I'm all ears, just like you are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that we were together a couple of weeks ago. You and I were. Sometimes we see each other at Jason's right. Deli. And that night I'd stopped by the University of Memphis Holiday Inn. There I, I forgot to print something out. I was going somewhere, so I stopped there real quick to run into the little computer station and print something out. And there was Carla Thomas sitting there on the on the really? couch watching the TV. You know, Rufus's daughter, Carla, who had a great singing career. And so we've known each other for a long well, time. Well, gee whiz. Gee whiz. Oh, and B-A-B-Y baby, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that's my favorite. But uh, we talked for a while, and we talked about G.K., George Klein. Mm -hmm. I said, we heard he's not doing good. And that night, well, I had to go to Jason's Daily to get my manager special, you know, and right. get on out of there. Right. And Fruit Cup, and you were sitting over there with Jason D. Williams, you right. know, your friend there. Right. It's like we came over and talked like we always do. And we, you and I kind of talked with we, we, person like George Klein was on our mind. Right. 
And sure enough, a few minutes later, you came mm-hmm. on me and you just started. He's, he's passed away. away. Right. And you're the one that told me that. And I've been thinking about it for a long time. George Klein was so good to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was at the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum, uh, he would tell me stories and verify things and, and all the musical things I got involved in from that. Mm-hmm.